at the end of the day, you can say you've trained a deep network after you've run this run this, this thing, because this is what it is. Just to demystify it slightly, it's just numbers going up and down. In a minute, after each epoch, we'll have a go at the testing set and we'll see what our current accuracy is. So this is actually training a deep network. This is deep learning that we're doing. It's just numbers going up and down, as I say. But it sounds like now is a great time to get in. It, yeah, yeah. It's a great time to be involved. Going from zero to transformers is going to take you a little bit of time, right? You, you know, you don't, you're not going to get that on the first day, but you work through small examples and, and then they, they, it will come. It's not, it's not so complicated. Once you once you start working through them. If you're a nerd, then you should be a brilliant. Dude, you really expect me to read all these books to be able to use AI? These are probably what you would encounter in a university course if you want to study AI. Is there an easier way than reading all this stuff? I really like brilliance.org and the reason for that is on their website they actually help you to learn the intuition behind AI and learn AI because they give you a lot of visual examples and you know when they are showing you some of the concepts it's not like you're going to go away from brilliant and have no clue what you're doing and what's really nice about brilliant is they have these great roadmaps a path that you can take they've got any scientific stuff that you might be interested in if you're a nerd you should be a brilliant so i really like that if you're a nerd you should be a brilliant use the link below if you want to sign up for a 30-day trial big thanks to brilliant for sponsoring this video one of the ways that I think you should, people should learn deep learning is just to really get stuck in, right? Now, yep. Detectron 2 is written by Meta. It's a library for, um, if you're going to do deep learning, right, there's a few things you might do. One is you might do classification. That's where you take an image and you say, what is it, right? Is it, is it a cat? Is it a dog? It's a bird. It's a plane. You might do regression where you say how much is something, like is it naught, is it one, is it 50? Um, and then another really common thing that you see is object detection. Right, now object detection is one where you take an image and you have to find all the objects in there, label what they are and label where they are. So there's a man on a horse and there's a man with, there's, there's the output of Detectron 2 running on, on that. Now that's actually a method called faster RCNN, which is a very popular and common piece of work. Now you'll find that a lot of AI companies that do any kind of object detection politely are using this. Very, very popular, very, very common, very easy to use, right? And it's a great introduction to deep learning because things like Detectron 2 come with Colab notebooks. So Google Colab is a Jupyter notebook style environment that's attached to Google's GPUs, right? Now I actually pay the, whatever it is, $8.99 a month so that I can get lots of priority access, but you can use it for free quite a lot, and they're very generous with the number of GPUs. You just can't get carried away, right? And no Bitcoin mining. So, um, <laughs> the, but, but you can see, actually, if we walk through the code, it's not too complicated. So you, here you're importing, you're, you're, you're checking the versions and PIP and stuff like this. You're installing Detectron 2 and Torch. This is written in PyTorch. So PyTorch is a library for deep learning that interfaces with Python. And then what we're going to do is we're going to just literally download a random image off the internet. We're going to stick it through our network, which is which is done here. And you can see, I'm not, we don't walk through all the code now, but you can see that it's not that much code. What Detectron 2 has done has taken is taken some quite complicated deep learning models and packaged them into simple function calls, right, to get things working. It gives you different bounding boxes of objects that you've done, and you can you can use them to show them on the screen, right? Now, what this collab book will do is it will take you from testing it on this image to actually training a new one for yourself. So you download a balloon, I think it's a balloon data set. You can train a new instance of Detectron 2 with a new model to detect balloons. And actually, if you think about it, going from detecting balloons to detecting any object is a case of new data. Yeah. So once you've done this collab tutorial and, you know, and hopefully understand a little bit about how the data set works, because that's really what this is about, is crafting the data set in a way that this understands, you, you're there, right? You can now detect cats, dogs, trees, cars, anything you like. You just produce, give it some data right? and then it, it will go. And actually, there are lots of examples in Colab and things like this where you can literally, uh, uh, the first go you ever use it, you just click play and just, and just see what it does. right? And then and you start to build up the complexity and tweak it for yourself. I find this is a really great way to see how things work. And there are versions of this, for example, for stable diffusion that generate images. And you can begin by just clicking play, generate an image, and then you can delve in and find out in a bit more detail about what's actually going on. And this is, this Detectron 2 is complicated, right? It's, it's complicated for someone who's never done machine learning before, 
but it isn't complicated to click play on these things. It's these kind of notebooks that I think start you off. And you know, if you know Python, you can understand this code. What, what this is, this code here is the only complicated bit. What this is doing here is it's taking your balloon, um, your balloon annotations, which are stored in a JSON file, and it's converting them into a dictionary and an array structure that to Tetron 2 wants. And once it's done that, you can then just pass them to it and it will train. It's not too complicated, right? It requires a bit of thought, but it's not, you know, it's not too bad. But I would say that there are lots of tutorials for things like PyTorch or TensorFlow that have collab implementations that let you play around and try things out. I've got another one. I did this for a, um, for a workshop actually on multitask learning. So multitask learning is when, it's quite simply when you have your network do two things at once, right? okay. or three things at once. And you might do that not because you want to do two things at once, but because the performance, the joint performance is better. For example, right, so I work a lot in plants, and this is a, this is a, you can have, people can absolutely have access to this Colab notebook, it's no, it's no problem. It's, it takes you from importing PyTorch, loading a, a data set of plants, all the way through to plant classification. So if I just connect to a GPU, uh, this is how easy it is, right? And I'm not, I don't want to sell my job short, right? Because I did, I, you know, it's not <laughs> trivial to, to, do, to do this, but once it's up and running, this is how you learn, right? So you run this, uh, it takes a minute the first time, although it used to be you had to install Torch, it's now much faster. Right, I'm going to load this. This is my data set. So the way that PyTorch works, you have a class that inherits from um, a data set. And what that allows it to do is, is retrieve individual images and labels that go with those images. So I'll give you an example. If we click this, right, so what this is doing is now creating a training set and a validation set. So the training set is what you train your network on, and the validation set is what you test to see whether it worked. Right. If you test on your training set, of course the performance is going to be good. Yep. Right. It doesn't, doesn't prove anything. I'll give you an example. If I press click, this is going to produce a random image from our training set. So this is a data set called PlantNet, which you can download for free on the internet. It's about 300,000 images of plants or something like that. Um, and I can click play and I can get random, random plants. So this is a whatever that plant is. <laughs> right. Um, now, so one of the things that I do to learn a new technique, sometimes in deep learning, I wrote this collab notebook, for example, as an, um, uh, for a tutorial that I was giving on multitask learning. Now, multitask learning, put simply, is just when you have lots and lots of different objectives, like two, three objectives, maybe more than that, for a network to try and get it to perform better overall. Right. Now, in this case, it's a plant data set because a lot of my research is on biological images. It's just, a, it's just a data set of a bunch of pictures of plants. The other task that I do is, is there a flower in the picture or not? Right? So one task is what species is this plant? And the other one is, is there a flower or not? And actually what this code does is it just begins by running the simple problem of just species classification, and then it extends it into the joint task of species and flower identification later, right? which we can kind of broadly ignore just from, from me showing you. Yeah, so what we can do, we can just run through this from the top to the bottom, but basically this is about as simple as a PyTorch installation gets because what we're doing is we're creating a data set of plants, we're giving the data sets to the network to train, and then we're training the network, and that's really all we're doing, right? You know, so if you want to know how to classify things in PyTorch, it's all in here, right? At least, at least you know, mostly before, you know, you can get a bit more complicated, but this, this will do the job. So we begin by importing um, the various libraries, and then we're going to load my plant that day now I've written this data set class as a way of bringing in plant images and feeding them into the network. Right? That's okay. the idea. Now, when you, run, when you run through tutorials on PyTorch and things like this, what you'll find is that a lot of it happens around data sets and data loaders. So you've got a network which is being trained, you've got a data loader which is multi-threaded and is bringing in images, and it's bringing in images from a data set. And that data set is just a, basically a big array of images. But they, they might or not be loaded into memory at one time is the idea. You know, so if you've got two billion images, you're only going to load a few at a time, and that's what the data set and the data loader are doing. So this is a very simple data set, which I adapted from one of the standard ones on the Py, in the PyTorch uh, library, which just downloads a zip file containing a load of plants and their labels, and then sets it up ready to go. So I've, I've already imported that, I think, and then we're gonna download and install this. So yeah, we can create, so you can see what's going on here is we're saying get a raw image from the training set and just with just a random number. And so if it was 10,000 images, you just pick a random number from 0 to 9999 and it would just produce you a flower. And that's how we train these networks 
on pairs of random images and labels. So you can see this one is a, la is a lavender plant and it also does have flowers in the picture. So for data loading, we're gonna set up some um, parameters. And if you take, for example, Andrew Uncle Machine Learning course and read a bit about this, you'll learn about things like batch size and other hyperparameters. So we'll load those up and we're gonna move them. This, this device.cuda is explained that we're gonna run on a GPU rather than on the CPU, and that will speed things up significantly. The model we're gonna use is a simple, it's what we call a simple ResNet, which is, which I'm gonna load up here. Uh, a ResNet is a very popular standard network that we use for lots of classification tasks and lots of other tasks. You know, you won't design necessarily every network you use from scratch, you'll just use a standard, and this is one of those standards. And it's also downloaded a pre-trained version of this. So all of these networks come pre-trained on something like ImageNet, which is cats, dogs, airplanes and stuff. The idea being that even if the task you're doing is slightly different, starting off from a position of a network that already works is still a good idea, rather than train it from scratch. Don't reinvent the wheel top thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and they just tend to train a little bit more easily and on, on fewer images as well. Right? If you've got yeah. a small data set, pre-training is really important. So um, that testing just shows you the layers of the model. Right, so um, you've got, there's lots of layers which we won't perhaps dwell on right now, but you know, there's lots of them. Let's train it. So if we go to training, we define our training function and actually there's not that, you can see, but for training a network, you might think it's complicated, it's not that many lines of code. Yeah. And that's because most of it's handled by PyTorch, right? The key one is, this is, the, this, is the, this is the line of code where we go through the network. We put our example image in and we see what we get. And these are the lines of code where we teach the network to get better at producing accurate results. So you, we compare what we got from the network against the target that was the actual label that was true. And we say, okay, with that in mind, get slightly better next time, right? And we move the network. And this is what the training process, we just loop this training process over and over again. Now, it's always good to test your network because if you test on the same data, you'll get really good results. It won't make any sense. It won't, it won't reflect accurately on what's going on. And then we're gonna run. So, um, an epoch is one go over all of the training set. And usually you train for multiple epochs. You can see that we've already done 900, 1200 images of our 6,400. And our loss function, which is how accurate we are, is going down, which is good, right? That means we're learning something. But in a minute, after each epoch, we'll have a go at the testing set and we'll see what our current accuracy is. So this is actually training a deep network. This is deep learning that we're doing. It's just numbers going up and down, as I say. It's difficult to tell from the loss whether it's working or not, so you have to produce actual percentage accuracy, right? Which is what we're gonna do in a minute. Right, okay, so after our first epoch, so that's one look at all the images, just one, which is not very many, right, in the grand scheme of things, our accuracy is 50%. So 50% of our plants, it correctly guessed the species. Right, we're only doing species classification. And now we start on epoch two, and you'll see that the loss is generally getting lower and lower, and it will get better and better. Right? Now, I, this, is, this is not a particularly easy data set, I would say, we'll, and this is a very small network, we'll probably get 60 or 70% maybe overall, I don't really know. This is a start, right? and then what you would do you would try a bigger network or you'd try more data or you would try some other machine learning techniques like data augmentation and things like this. Loads of different things you can try and, and slowly build up the complexity and your knowledge about what these things do. I mean, you've basically trained a, that, that's what you've done, yeah? You've trained, trained a neural network to do something. This is, like. this, is, this is a deep network, a very popular deep network called a ResNet, training as, as we watch. There's nothing magical about it, it's, just, it's numbers getting optimized. So we're now at 62% accuracy. This data set here is called PlantNet. PlantNet is a very, very big data set. This is my own mini version of PlantNet, which I did for demo purposes. So I, I only kept about 30 of the classes because yep. otherwise you get a lot of classes with only a couple of images in and you've got a whole different set of problems that are for when you know a bit more about these things, right? So for a demo, I think this was, this was what I wanted to do. And so actually, all deep learning is like this, right? Now, if you train a transformer, it won't look much different. It's just that the network we define above will be different. The data set might be similar, the training set might be similar, and you will still be doing it in PyTorch or TensorFlow or, or some other library if you have one. In terms of which you should use, I use PyTorch. PyTorch, I would say, is more popular, particularly in research, because it's quite flexible. You can say, well, I want to take a layer out and put a different layer in, and you can do all this stuff quite nicely. TensorFlow is particularly good if you want to deploy on a mobile phone like an Android device. So you can have a TensorFlow demo going up in just a few minutes that runs on a phone and does like live detection of objects around your room. Right? That's, that's how easy it is. 
it depends on what your, your task is. If you just want to use it as part of your pipeline, this demo is in PyTorch. I, I quite like PyTorch, but... So I, we, I finished training. I only specified that we do three epochs and our final accuracy was 77%. Now you want to do multitask learning, right? So we need to do something with our network that allows it to do two things at once. And what we're actually going to do is take the end of the network that makes the decision and split it in two and have two ends. One end is saying which class is it and the other is saying is there a flower or not. The flower detection is not a difficult task. That's not what this is about. It's a demo demonstration but you, you'll see so what we do is I've created a class called a multitask head which is just two output layers right so I'm going to define that and this is really all you need to know about PyTorch right if you look through this you can slowly understand what it's doing so we've got a, a small sequential neural network here which is created with a linear unit which is a normal neural network layer a nonlinear function which is what we always have between network layers and another linear unit, which is the num which predicts the number of classes. And I'm going to create two, one of which outputs 32 different species and one of which outputs yes or no, two, two classes, one or zero. So I'm going to create my multi test. So I'm going to create a new ResNet 18, but then I'm going to change the end of the network to be my new multitask head. So I'm just going to remove the end of the network, which was just producing like plants, and I'm going to put in my double output. And I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to extend my training and validation code slightly just to include flowers as well, right? So before we were saying, how accurate are you on your species classification? And now I'm saying, how accurate are you on your species classification? And also yes or no flower, right? Only a couple of lines have been changed, right? And you can compare the two. So I've got one loss function, it's how good are we at classes? And another loss function, which is how good are we at flower output? And our final loss is a weighted combination of those two things. So we'll run that. And then we're going to run our test, which is exactly the same, but we now output the accuracy of flowers as well. And let's train it. Good, right, now this will take a minute to do. You won't see any difference until we see the test accuracy because it's just training. But what's actually happening now is the network is making two predictions. One is what class is this object? And one is, is there a flower? And we're training it on both of those objectives. And one of the nice things about multitask learning is you might find that it performs slightly better on, let's say, flower classification or species classification if you're guiding it using the other as well. But it depends very much on, on precisely what you're doing and what your task is, but I use it quite a lot. But also this document gives you code that will produce a network, produce a data set and change your network. And really that's, that's what you do in PyTorch, right? That's, that's how you do deep learning. You know, create a network and train it. That's, that's how we do it. You can do this for free on Google Colab, right? Google, Google Colab is free. If you absolutely hammer it, yeah. right, then it might um, it might kick you off for a few hours, yeah. right, with fair usage. If you pay for a for a subscription, which is not very expensive, then you get priority access. But I used it for free quite happily. It's just that I'm doing a lot of demos at the moment, yeah. so I, I want it I want it on when I'm there rather than you know. So you can see here that our accuracy on our plant this is after one epoch. Our accuracy on plants is 51 percent. Our flower prediction actually is 83 wow. percent, which is kind of intuitive because. Is there a flower maybe strikes me as a slightly easier problem than what species is this? Yeah, certainly my experience with deep learning in general is if you think the problem's easy, it probably is easy, right? You know, and, and the harder problems do take longer to train. So Google Colab is free. This demo is, I wrote, you can have it. That's, that's absolutely fine. But there are loads of tutorials, like Tetron 2 has a great tutorial on object recognition and things like this. And I love learning by doing. I love learning oh, by... Yeah trying trying things out and you know you have to be disciplined right because you know when you're learning on your own steam you've got to you've got to you're going to crack on and do it but because i'm not there telling you to do it right <laughs> but i think that it is it is really good and at, at the end of the day you can say you've trained a deep network after you've run this run this this thing because this is what it is just to demystify it slightly it's just numbers going up and down here we go so we're at 69 percent and 82 percent. so that's getting better and we'll just train for one more epoch and we'll see actually i think the the, the cap i put on epochs here is six it's it's uh, it, will, it will train for six epochs so we can leave it now hypothetically suppose you wanted to de deploy this that's not what i do in this code but what you would do is you would save the configuration of the network after training and then you can reload it at any time so you could then, instead of saying pre-trained equals true and downloading a generic ResNet, you could download your specific ResNet, which you knew solved this task. 
right? And that's what deployment is. So if you, if you know, for any AI company that's deploying networks, they train them offline, and then they put that published model on to some API or some server, and then that runs when they need it to. I was going to say, and if I don't un quite understand this, I need to learn Python, and then I need to go and go through Andrew's course on Coursera, right? Yeah, so I would say Python is a really strong language to learn if you, if you want to do any machine learning or data analysis, because that's where all the libraries are. Right, they, they do exist in other ones. You could do R, you could do MATLAB, but there's a huge amount of stuff on Python and it works really, really well. So yeah, Python is a good place to start. And then in terms of uh, machine learning, Andrew Ong's course will teach you how machine learning works at, a, at an introductory level, but will give you lots of intuition about what this loss function is and what that means. Is it good that it's 1.03? Those are the things you'll learn from that course. And then things like this document are, I mean, I, I could write some text to explain what any of it does, but that's what I'm doing now, you know, but the, the tutorials and things like PyTorch and TensorFlow on platforms like Colab are a great place to just run things. See, what would happen if I changed the output of my network to be a different shape? And, you know, does that, what happens? What happens if I only use five of my 32 classes? Does that make my problem easier or harder, right? And you can play around with these things and you can slowly begin to learn more about it. And I would fa I find that within a few months, most of the students that I teach, within a few months of running these things occasionally and experiencing the output, you start to get a really good, solid understanding of what it is that's going on. Right? Even if the first time you don't really, which is kind of the hope, isn't it? And I mean, the, the, this is the kind of thing that you we, you, we spoke previously about like a, a Rubik's Cube and stuff like that, your students were, 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 were learning. It's the same kind of idea, right? Yeah. So on, on, for, for, the, for Detectron, what we're doing, we're using Detectron 2 to do object recognition, but instead of balloons, we're using faces of a Rubik's Cube. Yeah. They've obviously got quite a lot of heavy lifting to do after that, because yes, the network might tell them where there's a square, but they've got to then work out what configuration the cube is in and solve it. So there's a lot for them to do. But it's that same kind of idea yeah. of, we frame the problem as, a, as one of object detection, and then we can go, we can run with that, and we can collect data, and we can go. So, you know, one of, one of the ways that you might, might tackle a machine learning problem, you've got some problem you want to solve, first got to decide what class of problem it is. Classification, segmentation, object detection, and then when you, when you know that, there are then particular techniques you can apply. So once this thing has been trained, can I download it and then run it on like a Raspberry Pi, or does it always have to connect back to Google? Yeah. Yeah, but with a caveat that if your system, for, I mean, for ResNet 18, you'll get away with it. For a big network like a transformer, it's going to be really, really slow if you're not running it on some kind of graphics enabled uh, thing. As far as I know, you can you might be able to do a little bit of that on a Raspberry Pi. There are like other things like, I think there was an NVIDIA Jetson, which is like a little nano PC with a GPU on it. There's loads of cool things you can do. And again, your, your mobile phone now is capable of this in real time, basically, certainly for object detection tasks. So. Yeah, you can deploy these things on small devices. You'll just, you'll just notice that for what I call inference, which is when you're running it later and it's already been trained, that's quite fast. Even on a CPU, it's not bad. If you order a second or two. For training, it really needs to be on a graphics card because the, there's a lot of heavy lifting going on mathematically behind the scenes. It just takes a very long time on a CPU. But any graphics card that supports CUDA, so NVIDIA graphics cards, will work really well with PyTorch and TensorFlow. Right? And they're very easy to set up. And you can see the final accuracy we got was 84%, 86%. So they roughly met in the middle in the end. That's great. Uh, so I'll take that, that's not bad, eight out of 10. When I taught that tutorial on multitask learning, which I've delivered a couple of times, you know, I'll have some slides that talk about in principle what's happening here for those people that have some knowledge of, of a material and then we'll just get the code out and we'll have a go because I think that there's a lot of, um, you talk about training a network, what does that mean? Well, what it means is you put in examples and then you optimize the network to be better next time and there's only about four lines of code that actually do that. Once you know those four lines of code, you can do whatever you want, right? And you can train any task and, and it gets much, much more fun. I love what you've done there because I mean, if people can download that example, uh, I'll put that below, um, they can get started. And I mean, with Andrew's course and um, other stuff that's available, I mean, you can hit the ground running. So, you know, you can learn this stuff pretty quickly, it sounds like. There's a GitHub repository associated with the PyTorch project called Examples, right? Which unsurprisingly has some examples on. Now, some of those examples are very advanced because they're like, you know, super impressive reinforcement learning and stuff. But there are also very simple examples like the MNIST example, which is kind of even simpler than this. There are lots of examples online and tutorials that explain them. What this 
this document on Colab doesn't have is any like text explanations to go with each thing. But I think that we've just, we've, we talked about that. Hopefully we've talked a bit about what it does. And I think that once you've done Andrew Arnold's course and so you know about, about machine learning in general, you can, you can start training up some deep networks in PyTorch with a few, a few tutorials and some documents like this. I don't anticipate that everyone's going to be training unbelievably complicated deep networks all the time, you know, for a while, because I think that they don't need to for a start. I mean, there's people who are trained to do it, but I think that everyone can get things running and get, get going. And if you can do simple object detection and simple classification, that might solve a little task in your pipeline that you, you was, all, was otherwise a bit of a pain. Right? You know, you've got an image uploader and, they, and you want to make sure that they're uploading pictures of trees before you put them in your repository. Just do a simple classifier that says, is it a tree or not? And then you can just completely kill off that problem of people uploading stuff that isn't trees. It, simple little things in your pipeline that can, can really help. It's exactly that. I mean, I think the ChatGPT, if it's done nothing else, it's going to bring a lot of new people to the, um, to the AI field because people are saying, okay, this is amazing. You know, it's that whole thing, you've got to sell it. And I think that's sold it for a lot of people, even though it's yeah. a lot of it's hype, but it's been sold. Where's yeah, the... I, I think, you know, you saw, you saw my code is in some ways interesting, in some ways it's not interesting, right? It's just Python code, it, it, it's numbers going up and down. It's not, it's not got the same lure as the chat GPT interface. But you need some tools like that to get people in, right? And if I, from my point of view as a lecturer, if some students decide to come and learn about computer science because they want to know more about these things, then that's a win as well, right? You know, and they may end up working in AR, they may end up working in some other field of computer science, but either way, they're, they're, they're engaged in the subject. So I think it's, it's good. I, I, when I looked, because like when, after you and I spoke, it was like, okay, this is, uh, this is cool and all, but how do we... How do you get people interested? And I think ChatGPT has really just blown it away. I think from my point of view, the, the interesting thing has been, I've been watching some discussions between some quite heavy hitting AI researchers on, uh, on Twitter. And, you know, the head of OpenAI will say, this has changed the way we think. And the, and the, and the, uh, the head of Facebook AI will go, no, it hasn't, right? You know, and it's, like, it's quite funny to watch this kind of interplay between them. And I find myself kind of not really minding who wins. I just think it's funny. Yeah, I think that it's incredibly impressive. It's going to be really interesting to see where we go. The other, I mean, from my point of view, I'm also really interested in the um, diffusion models that produce images because, of course, a lot of what I do is images. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they, that's also a bit like ChatGPT. That's also been really transformative in the last six months. Just out of nowhere, we've been faffing about with GANs for, for five or 10 years of trying to get these things to work, and they kind of do. And then someone's come up with a diffusion model that's just gone, it's just unbelievably realistic or exactly what you wanted. The funny thing is, actually, as an aside, is that the, they also use large language models to encode the text. You know how we were doing machine translation? You go from English to a latent yeah. space to, 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 to French. Well, in this one, you're going from English to a latent space and then guiding using that in the image generation process. So they all, it's all coming full circle and they're all just in everything, right? These, these transformers. But it sounds like now is a great time to get in. It, yeah, yeah. It's a great time to be involved. Going from zero to transformers is going to take you a little bit of time, right? You, you know, you don't, you're not going to get that on the first day, but you work through small examples and, and then they, they, it will come. It's not, it's not so complicated once you, once you start working through them. Mike, is it too late for me to get into AI? No, no. Um, no, if, I mean, look. Six months ago, ChatGPT didn't exist. Stable Diffusion didn't exist a few months ago, right? And so we didn't think it was too late then. It's not, nothing's changed. It's just that we've got some more exciting products to try out. There's loads more research to do. We already talked about the, the weaknesses of things like ChatGPT, right? And we can say that without criticizing the, the work, which is really good. There are lots of things they don't do. And someone's got to get them to do those things. And so if you want to be a researcher in AI or you just want to use AI in your projects, there's loads more to do. And the other thing is that ChatGPT doesn't solve all of your problems. It's very good at text. If you want to analyze images, that's not what ChatGPT is for. So you need a different solution, and that's maybe one you can train yourself. I think get into it and, 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 and play around and have some fun. And, you know, it will come in useful. That's brilliant, Mike. Thanks so much for sharing and, you know, making it available for everyone. No problem. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. I, uh, I like people to learn these things.